Goa beyond the beaches. This is something which is, you know, totally Goa beyond the beaches is an offbeat topic. Now, very often the Bollywood projects Goa as uh, as uh, all the girls in Goa are Marias. All the boys in Goa are either Johns or Francis. That's the general belief of Bollywood. And that is how only the Catholic lifestyle is projected through the films. I completely beg to differ on this. We have a rich history and heritage that goes beyond the beaches. Beaches are very important and our, to Goa is internationally renowned for the beaches. They are part of our natural heritage. But through this talk and presentation, I would like to take you on a journey of Goa, which is beyond the beaches. I started out with clarifying a misconception that all the people living in Goa, the rest of the country feels are Catholic, they are Portuguese, they are Marias and they are Johns. They are not. There are 65% of the Goans are Hindus. 35% are uh, Christians and the remaining are Muslims. Okay. So we have a rich pre-Portuguese heritage. We have a Portuguese period and we have the post-liberation period. Now the term Susegad. The rest of the country feels that Goans are laid back, perhaps lazy, I do not know what is the impression. This term Susegad, let me clarify, means relaxed. It is not lazy, but it is being misinterpreted that it means lazy, it is not. Susegad means relaxed. And relaxed, yes, the Goans are relaxed in their lifestyle. So there are a lot of misconceptions about Goa, misrepresentation about Goa for touristic consumption. So through this presentation, I would like to highlight the fact that we are very much part of our great motherland India. Goans are very much Indians. We are not Portuguese. Yes, the Portuguese ruled over Goa for 451 years with her varying boundaries from 1510 to 1961. And the tourism department of Goa has projected Goa as a destination of booze, fun, frolic, music that the Goans just dance throughout the night. They drink and they um, sleep in the afternoons. Uh, it, it's a completely kind of a negative picture. So I would like to demolish all those beliefs that the rest of my brothers and sisters of the country have about Goa. So, so Goa beyond the beaches. Now let me first at the outset talk about what is this Goa, G-O-A. There are a series of names that you come across. First name that we come across is in our own uh, mother tongue Kokani, that is Goin, Kokani word, Goin. Goin is the first original name of Goa in our Kokani. That is actually when we speak Kokani, we call, uh, we don't say Goa, we say Goin. It means a re, uh, land rich in paddy harvest, paddy harvest, rich in agriculture abounding in cows and all the names till we come across come across the final culmination as Goa. It is Goya, Goya, Goy, Gove, Gomantak, Gopakapur, Gomanchal, Goparast, Gopradesh, Guba, Goapuri, Gopakapattan. So all these names 
are prefixed by the word go and go in sanskrit means cow but we since kokni is derived from prakrit i am in a process of trying to find out whether it me uh, in prakrit to uh, go means cow so this picture gives you the meaning of the word goa the final culmination is the word goa now the portuguese during portuguese rule she came to be known as goa g o a to rhyme with lisboa lisboa is lisbon that is the portuguese capital and since they were ruling over goa to rhyme with their portuguese Portug uh, portugal's capital portuguese capital of lisboa they made it goa and boa means good so from goi it goes up down up to goa so today we are known as goa so here you see the slide of the we have beautiful natural heritage sites when you visit goa don't miss out on this slide on this site this is a lagoon flanking the paliam beach next to the famed arambol beach it is in the north of goa and there is a lagoon a lot of foreigners visit that place and this is a must see place in goa also rich in history and heritage a very popular theory about goa's creation is the parshuram legend the parshuram legend tells you that per lord parshuram stood upon the hills that you see on your screen he shot an arrow the sea was up to the bottom of these mountains which are part of the western ghats and he commanded the sea to retreat to create the land of goa which he called as gomantak to settle the 96 saraswat brahmin families in goa now this particular legend mythology myth part of oral history history has been perpetuated by the saraswat community to legitimize the fact that it is aryans who have created the land of gomantak now from here from this legend we need to sift history from this legend obviously you cannot have parshuram shooting an arrow commanding the sea to retreat and the uh, sea uh, listens to his command and the land of gomantak is created a very settles the 96 saraswat family yes there are 96 saraswat families my ancestors belong to the same community now this when you sift history it's connected with geology the geological phenomenon took place where it is in the in the rest of the world also the tectonic movements and how the seas retreated and the lands were created that theory geological theory was used to perpetuate this particular myth that it was the aryans who come, uh, who created the land of gomantak there was no goa before that but this myth demolishes the historical fact that there were tribal communities in goa we have a sizable amount uh, uh, number of tribal communities in goa such as the kunbis the gaudas the velips the fisher folk a very important community in goa so that is that's that has taken a back seat and this myth has been perpetuated down the ages i am not trying to disregard it it's part of my ancestry but a geological we have to understand it from the geological point of view from oral history and uh, so i just wanted to demolish uh, certain misconceptions that people have the natural heritage of goa goa is blessed with natural heritage we have beautiful beaches the golden beaches in the north and the pristine white beaches in the south these have been advertised all over the world and goa has emerged as an international tourist destination thanks to these beaches and we need tourists in goa we survive uh, uh, our economy is based on tourism and without tourists we are zero so we need these beaches 
but here we are looking at goa beyond the beaches here we have beautiful waterfalls in goa this is a beautiful village called kuske which lies in the kotigaon wildlife sanctuary we have various wildlife sanctuaries when you visit goa do visit this village called kuske where you will find the original tribal community culture which is still retained by the tribal communities of wales there are two waterfalls there seasonal and perennial the highest mountain peak of goa is sosodurg or sosogar this is part of the western ghats we climbed this sosogar in 2004 it was a beautiful experience and when you visit goa do make it a point to climb the sosogar the highest mountain peak of goa and we discovered a cave on top of this mountain we explored the cave and it was a wonderful experience there are a number of tunnels caves caverns in goa we explored one such tunnel many of you who have visited goa are familiar with the daboli airport and very close to the daboli airport contiguous with the daboli airport underground below the railway station there is a huge tunnel a natural tunnel we explored that of course we couldn't couldn't go beyond uh, up to the sea it goes up to the sea and we were trying to understand if this was a human habitation also we did not find any clue but we keep on exploring these tunnels which give you clues of the antiquity of goa the antiquity of goa which is nowhere people don't talk about the antiquity of goa in fact i would like to thank the kaki foundation for giving me this opportunity to uh, you know show you goa which is not the conventional goa the unconventional goa here we explored one cave a large number of caves we have one such uh, underground cave chamber was in this uh, very close to the city of vasco where the airport is located and uh, we found um a pot shed there then there were other caves such as this chikali cave which is also near vasco we found a pot uh, dr gritley mitter volner was a german scholar she had found pot sheds in this and this is this particular cave the chikali cave is the first sign of human life in goa in the village of chikali which is uh when you come from the daboli airport and when you go to panji on the way you come across chikali village and there this site is located we explored it along with the archaeological survey of india and the goa state archaeology department we released a ladder and an electric bulb we explored it there were three such caves there underground caves now we are not trying to say that they were paleolithic human habitations but we are uh, definitely they are of the megalithic age uh, and since the potsherds were found it's a question mark before us whether the pot shards were part of the granary pots were stored or um, uh, uh, what kind of you know it's open to interpretation we have asked the asi to notify the site and uh, so there are this is the first site then you have these various caves that we explored this is a cave temple dedicated to the tiger called vagro dev okay this is on the dud sagar river bed that dud sagar is a beautiful waterfall in goa and on the river bed of dud sagar you find this cave temple dedicated to tiger worship that shows that the tribal communities were worshiping nature this is at another underground cave here we are uh with the archaeology department of goa this is inside the cave those of you who have visited goa have heard about the river mandovi in fact our city panjim in which i am located is laced flanked by the mandovi river it's a famous river beyond mandovi we have various other rivers such as the kushavati river these are the backwaters of goa now this slide shows you the kushavati river in the south of goa and on the banks of the kushavati river we had a rich 
civilization and a rich heritage. The first capital of Goa was Chandrapur or Chandor, which was located on the banks of this particular village called Chandor by the Portuguese. But in pre-Portuguese times, she was known as Chandrapur. When you visit Goa, please don't miss out on this particular site. We have a group called Goa Heritage Action Group and we are trying to get this notified by the UNESCO. In fact, we made a presentation before the UNESCO committee in uh, Bombay, uh, but we have not yet gone to, uh, got through uh, to this getting the, uh, it notified under UNESCO or under ASI. Presently, it is under the Goa State Archaeology Department. Now, this site is one of the oldest sites of Goa. It is the petroglyph heritage. It is on the banks of the Kushavati River and in a hamlet called Pansaimar in the village of Dhandole in South Goa, you have this beautiful rock art heritage site. Petroglyphs, as you know, Petra is rock and glyph is art. So rock art. On the laterite bed, you find this rock art. Unfortunately, none of the domestic tourists, neither the foreign tourists, a few of foreign tourists now are aware of this site, but mostly the domestic tourists on the tourism itinerary, this site does not feature. So please make it a point to visit the ancient sites of Goa. One of these is Pansaimar. You can note down this site, Pansaimar, on the banks of Kushavati, very beautiful site. So on the expanse of the laterite bed, you have these figures of a humped bull and a deer locked in battle. Uh, you can see the contours of the peacock. Here you have a nude human figure, uh, a labyrinth. And uh, this labyrinth or a maze I was trying to corroborate when I visited the Canada and US museums. There again, I found these labyrinths. Uh, uh, so we do not know who, which community has carved this. There is no evidence to this. We only know that it is megalithic. We had a, we had a problem in dating this because the carbon 14 and carbon 15 dating technique cannot be employed on the laterite stone. So we had a problem. So approximately 8,000 years old, this site is Pansaimar. Do make it a point to visit this, a humped bull there, at the same site. Now this is the first capital of Goa called Chandrapur or Chandor. The first fort of Goa, you just have a mud ramification lap. Nothing of the fort remains. We are trying our best to protect this fort, preserve this fort for posterity. However, the you know the authorities in Goa, the it's very difficult. Uh, so we are trying our best through the Goa Heritage Action Group to preserve and protect this remnant of the first fort of Goa, the Chandrapur fort. And this is an ancient temple there, which was uh, 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 which is located in Chandrapur and which was built by the Kadamba king. And another beautiful village of Goa, which you must visit is Vitsunre, where you have this beautiful icon of Narayan Dev, a form of Vishnu. Here you can see the Narayan Dev, we have Sati stones. This is at another petroglyph site in a village called Maushi. Maushi is a very beautiful village in the eastern part of Goa, nestled among the Sayyadris with a river bed called the Zarme river bed. Unfortunately, some of miscreants, you know, have written something there. And I found recently on my visit that there is a stone and somebody has carved yet another bull over there. So, you know, we, uh, unfortunately, we do not have a sense of history and uh, we write our names on the walls of the fort and all those. And abroad, when I went abroad, I did not find any of such uh, things. And, uh, you, you know, this is how we treat our heritage, unfortunately. The tribal communities of Goa, these are the tribal communities of Goa called the Kundis. You have Gaudas and Velids. This is the heritage sari of Goa, the Kundi sari. It is a red checked sari. They, you should tie it in a knot. Earlier, they should not wear the blouses. Today, of course, they wear the blouses. So this is a heritage sari, the red checked Kundi sari. So when you are visiting Goa, do take it as a souvenir, the Kundi red checked sari. These are the Gaudas. These are basically the agricultural communities of Goa. These are the Velips with their folk dance. Goans cannot do without fish. 
in our diet daily diet we have rice and we have fish curry and fried fish of course vegetables the local vegetables the staple food of goa is rice and fish curry and fried fish so here you have our karvi fisher folk community see you can see this man dressed in a kashti a red checked kashti was the original heritage costume of the male fisher folk community and also of the gaudas kurmis and velips the tribal community here is a fisher woman who is selling dry fish in the mapsa market we have the most popular fish in goa the poor man's pomfret that is the bangdo mackerel then you have the kube the shellfish the black clams we make curries out of the out of it the goan housewife can make n number of dishes out of bangdo different types including the mackerel heads especially curries you have the crabs we have the kalwa the oyster curry we have the mussels the shinani we call them traditional earthen utensils of goa the burkulo for rice now this is for the fish curry kulne whatever came from nature our ancestors made best use of them and at the back you see a water canteen a water container it was a mart before the arrival of the portuguese there was no cock spout after the arrival of the portuguese a cock spout was added to it because the national bird of portugal at that point of time of oporto was cock and in most of the goan houses of the portuguese era you will find that there are there is the rooster or the cock on the gables of the houses reminding you of the portuguese era this is our traditional sweet uh, i wouldn't say it's a sweet uh, it's a dish called satwa made of nashni nashni is one very popular item in goa this is our rice fish curry you have the goan women have a variety of ornaments you will find there are different types of ornaments that they wear now this slide i should have put earlier this is a prehistoric stone uh, in a village called kajur or kajra you have this uh, a stone wherein you have the petroglyphs of the antelopes goa is noted for her kavi art unfortunately you will never find on a touristic brochure <clears throat> the kavi art most of the temples you will find this kavi art it's a beautiful unique form of art where the design is chipped on the walls on a wet plaster and it's called kav kav is uramunji the in the red soil of goa you have this material which our ancestors used for creating these designs decorating the temples with kavi art even houses the pre portuguese houses have this kavi art uh, see very often uh, sometimes the tourist guides they misguide you when you, you see what you see in the churches is not kavi art although the color is red that is graffito which the portuguese introduced in goa but this is pre portuguese kavi art this was one such temple this is the temple which our goa heritage action group we managed to restore it this is an old photograph we uh, got it conserved it is the temple of shetrapal entirely in kavi art again you will see kavi art on the walls of the mulvir temple in north goa in pedne where you have the mahabharat and the ramayan scenes from mahabharat ramayan dashavatar are etched on the walls using natural dyes again this temple we were fighting to preserve it save the kavi art of goa this is river madai or mandavi this is my ancestral village of ameshi in spite of the mining around it it is pristine green and very beautiful is an ancient temple in ambeshi village dedicated to shivling there is a general belief that goa is about churches and portuguese rule the renel the tori taper where the kashti goes up to the coconut tree coconut tree is 
the state heritage tree of goa we have two state heritage trees matti and coconut tree the rene draws liquor sur and he also draws toddy which is used for the traditional goan sweets the jaggery the coconut jaggery this is a pond which we are trying to save in south of goa we have stone memorials in goa which are commemoration of the dead professor romila thapar opines that these stone circles were in honor of the dead in her book early india here you can see the commemorative megaliths this is an interesting structure in goa in the village of azagaon in a pyramidical form but it was to mark the boundaries of villages you must have heard of anjuna which is famous for the anjuna beach this particular village is azagaon the valley of flowers where you find this demarcation of uh, boundaries the yoni and the you have the roind being worshiped the earth goddess and there's a face which is called sateri which was given later on and that is the presiding deity of goa the sateri these are all our deities the folk dances of goa the jagor which is performed by the gaudas we have the folk festival of goa is shigmo where the tribal communities celebrate a rich harvest they perform various dances and that folk festival is known as shigmo the various folk dances gode modni dhalo dhalo is a one of the popular folk dances of goa this is at another tribal community called the dhangars and the gaulis which perform the chapai in a village called maloli in eastern part of goa kashi fugdi here you have exorcist festivals dedicated to festival of ghosts called butanchi jatra in a village called narve where the souls of those hindu women who died in child birth their souls are their souls are supposed to be coming alive on this particular occasion of the butanchi jatra festival of ghosts which takes place in the month of august in fact i went with my students to see if i can see some ghosts i did not see anybody in fact we were not allowed to stay beyond sunset the belief of the people is after sunset the ghosts of these women comes alive and they said that you cannot stay beyond sunset there was a person who came from the city and tried to challenge the traditional beliefs of the villagers and next day is um, uh, his body was found hanging on a tree this is what the people believe i have not experienced any ghosts this is a crocodile worship in goa not a real crocodile this is a festival dedicated to it one of the most beautiful shivlings in goa in a village called ravan the oldest idol of ganpati of the badami chalukya period this is parshuram the famous festival of goa is chavat the ganesh chaturthi the first dynasty historically known to be ruling over goa to have ruled over goa for which we have authentication through copper plates was the bhoj dynasty they ruled from 4th to 6th century c and the first king of goa was devraj bhoj following the bhoj dynasty we have the konkan maurya kings in the 7th century c then we have the badami chalukyas from karnataka in the 7th century c the first woman ruler of goa was queen vijay bhattarika or vijay mahadevi then came the shilaharas from maharashtra from in the 8th and 10th century c this is the copper plate inscription of the first king of goa called devraj bhoj this is a beautiful temple on a hill called chandra chandranath parvat this was built by the bhoj kings and it is dedicated to chandreshwar and at the side of chandreshwar there is a shrine dedicated to bhutanath again exorcist rituals are seen here so when in goa do make it a point to climb those 100 steps and go to and go and visit this temple this is a interesting ritual where four five gades 
men in trance they prostrate on the in the forecourt of the mallikarjun temple in kanakon in south goa and they make a hearth of their heads and rice is cooked on their heads it's lit and it is cooked then there are four men standing at the side one man goes in a complete trance he draws a sword hits on one of the men standing there draws blood mixes it with the rice and smears on the people and the belief is that the god mallika arjun given prasad and now everything will be fine with the village this is an exorcist festival that takes place in south of goa shisha ragni this is at another very exorcist festival that takes place in the eastern part of goa in the taluka called sattari in a place called zarme and karanzol in two villages where the goddess that is men in trance are buried up to their neck inside the ground there are four men who are buried with their heads only the torso is seen and there are four men who are buried with their heads out and the body is inside the ground and this is called sorotso festival of thieves this i'm showing you the exorcist side of goa the festivals that are performed which the tourists are not at all aware of here you have at another ritual festival that is performed in south of goa in the village of zamauli where this man digs his puts his hand in a hot burning vessel and draws vade not batata vade but vade is a kind of a savory which is made in goa and i was standing very close to him and i, I of course i did not dip my dip my hand in the vessel uh, so he dipped it and there were no blisters or boils on his uh, palm the various heritage houses of goa very often the tourists describe his heritage houses as portuguese houses they are not portuguese houses they are indo portuguese houses they are a fusion of indian and portuguese elements of architecture this was a house where in i spent my childhood we have a balcony at the entrance of the house which is a seat balcony these are the harvane caves of goa we have professor romila thapar along with us we visited the harvane caves this is a 15th century jain temple in goa of the vijayanagar period this is a stone inscription in goa now i have talked about bhoj konkan maurya kings badami chalukya kings shilahar kings and then came the famous dynasty that ruled goa for three and a half centuries called the kadambas the kadam dynasty from karnataka ruled over goa from 960 to 1356 and the name kadam has come from this tree you can see the flower here with a globular head the kadamba flower this is the lion emblem of the kadambas this temple i would request all of you must visit this this is a transplanted temple one of the oldest temples in goa built by the kadamba king shastadev one in 960 c there is an inscriptional evidence to prove this this was in one village called kurdi which gets submerged in the rains in the summer that village and all the monuments come out now they were constructing a dam and the archaeological survey of india saved this temple from submergence they meticulously numbered every stone and they reassembled this temple at the salauni dam site when in goa the tourists do visit the salauni dam but on the upper side of the salauni dam there is this transplanted temple built by the kadambas please make it a point to visit this temple this is the kadamba inscription this gives us authentication that the kadamba king veeravarma dev ruled over goa this is his seal and you can see three copper plates this is the kadamba king and a queen this is one of the descendants of the kadambas called sadadan kadam who i interviewed he lives in panjim he belongs to the chittakul line of kadambas but the kadambas that ruled over goa were the banwasi kadambas they all originally hailed from the talgunda village of the shimoga taluka of karnataka and they spoke kannad and the script is hale kannad again while in goa 
do make it a point to visit this mahadev temple of tamri sulla built by the kadamba queen kamla devi very beautiful temple built in the 1175 1175 76 that is the 12th century this was i used a temple in belgaum which was built by kadambas to corroborate my research when i was doing my mphil the name of the kadamba queen kamla devi is inscribed i found it in uh, one temple in karnataka i have used it for corroboration the halekarnad script of the kadambas you can see on your screen the name kadam shivachitta parmadi dev the name of the kadamba king and sri sapta koteshwar the family deity of the kadambas we have a number of temples dedicated to sapta koteshwar a form of shiva in goa this is a temple which was destroyed by the portuguese in 1541 it was built by the kadamba queen kamla devi in 1155 on an island of divar so while in goa do make it a point to visit the beautiful island of divar on which this temple tank is located later on it was shifted across the river to that territory which was not under the portuguese at that point of time and later on chhatrapati shivaji maharaj uh, had renovated that temple this is at another beautiful temple dedicated to sapta koteshwar built by the kadambas we managed to save this temple and there is a river this is on the banks of the river of khanepar there is a beautiful dome on top this is the famed budbudanchi tai in the south of goa in a village called netravali where you have series of bubbles coming up to the surface the people believe the folklore is that once you clap the bubbles come but even if you don't clap the bubbles still come it's a very interesting pond uh, um, and there was a temple there the gopina temple the temple still exists but the original temple does not exist they demolished the temple we went to the we moved the court we moved the court on this particular case we dragged the temple committee to the court but unfortunately um the minister the then minister of archaeology gave them permission to demolish the temple and now a horrendous temple has come up at the site we could not save this temple they even scooped out the rock cut niches we are trying our best to save our heritage but sometimes it is very difficult to knock at the doors of the government authorities goa is full of temples this is the nageshi temple and there is an inscription of vijayanagar era there dating to 1413 this is at another temple dedicated to vimleshwar this is the vijayanagar era inscription after kadambas you have vijayanagar dynasty ruling over goa from 1340 onwards and the bahamanis and vijayanagar had a constant struggle with each other they were rivals over trade and goa was flourishing in horse trade the arabs used to bring in horses here goa was not noted for spices vasco da gama came to india to malabar region he landed at kapadavaku in a place uh, called kapadavaku in kojikode which is modern calicut and he came for the black pepper the kali mirch we indians were famous all over the world for our masala especially black pepper it was known as black gold but goa we have a spice called tefra which we use in fish curries especially the bangda curry here the vijayanagar and bahamanis were rivals over goa to control the horse trade brought in by the arabs the arabs used to trade in horses here fine quality horses which they brought from muscat and persia and one of the reasons why the portuguese were attracted to attracted to goa was because of horse trade a flourishing horse trade that fetched a huge revenue to the local ruler vasco da gama had come to india for spices to kerala for spices afons de albuquer conquered goa now there is a misconception among people in one particular bollywood movie called jos they said that vasco da gama conquered goa vasco da gama did not conquer goa it was afons de albuquer who conquered goa from the adil shah of bijapur vasco da gama the question is did vasco da gama came to goa and rule over goa yes vasco da gama did come to goa in 1524 and he ruled goa for just 3 months and then he passed away in december 24 1524 and was buried in cochin but the person the portuguese governor who conquered goa was afons de albuquerque after the bahamanis you have the adil shahi rule over goa in panjim the capital of goa is panji or panjim where i reside you have this adil shah's palace this was old secretary it also now we have a new secretary across the river mandavi 
the adil shah's palace this was built by adil shah and taken over by the portuguese the safa masjid of konda the safa masjid of konda although the asi has put up a plaque saying that it was built in 1560 my research showed me that it was built in 1518 and the oldest masjid in goa i should say one of the oldest because during the kadamba period the kadamba king jaykeshi one had permitted his uh, donated land to his chief minister saddam to construct a masjid in goa in the 11th century nothing remains of that masjid but this is the oldest standing temple the standing masjid in goa dating to 1518 built by asad khan for ismail adil shah 1 the son of yusuf adil shah who was the founder of the adil shahi dynasty yusuf adil shah was the founder of the adil shahi dynasty he set another adil shahi masjid this is the darga the banks of the river tirakol the at the back you see the mountain that is maharashtra maharashtra is separated from goa by the tirakol river in the northern side but the tirakol fort which is geographically lying in maharashtra and the tirakol village which is geographically lying in maharashtra belongs to goa because of historical reasons because the bosles of savantwadi the king bosles of savantwadi surrendered this fort and the northern part of goa to the portuguese in 1788 so in 1788 the tirakol fort and the village became part of portuguese goa this is a namazgah which was built for shehzada akbar the second not the original big akbar whom we refer as akbar the great the mogal emperor this was the rebellious son of aurangzeb that had rebelled against his father and taken shelter in goa in a village in a place called bicholi and chatrapati sambhaji who was then the ruler of north goa had given him shelter and his masgah was built there the only piece of mughal architecture in goa rest are all adil shahi masjid now chatrapati shivaji had conquered goa in 1664 i mean the northern part of goa followed by his son chatrapati sambhaji during the portuguese times 1510 we take out take as the cut out date the watershed year the turning point in goa's history when the portuguese set their foot on the soil of goa this is the exact location these are the laterite steps from which afons de albuquerque entered goa in 1510 this is in old goa old goa today is an internationally renowned tourist destination where the relics of st francis xavier are housed in the basilica of bon jesus this is exactly the entry point from where the portuguese entered now how do i know this little further there is an inscription telling you that this was the entry point of afons de albuquerque now afons de albuquerque the portuguese governador or governor was invited by timaya timaya was the captain of the vijayanagar navy he had ambitions to become the ruler of goa he invited afons de albuquerque to take over goa to dislodge the adil shah for his vested interest and albuquerque was lured by the horse trade now timaya's calculation was he was known as timaya or timappa naik and the portuguese called him timoja his calculation was that afons de albuquerque the portuguese are only interested in trade he would we would uh, i would give him the uh, hand over the horse trade to him he would be happy enough and he would be not interested in political and administrative power but the calculation of timaya misfired afons de albuquerque was very much interested in the horse trade earning a huge revenue and also to spread roman catholicism in goa and another goan who had invited uh, afons de albuquerque was marupoy vernekar because he found the land tax of the adil shah was very heavy so the adil shah was dislodged from goa adil shah of bijapur and on 1st march 1510 afon de albuquerque conquered the island of goa i am located on the island of goa that is goa island tiswadi and he entered from old goa today it is known as old goa in pre portuguese times it was known as ella goa then portuguese called it vela goa vela goa when translated is old goa afon de albuquerque 
conquered goa on 1st march 1510 he was defeated by the adil shah on 17th may 1510 with additional forces and vigor and with the help of a few goans afons de albuquerque reconquered the island of goa on 25th november 1510 Afonso de Albuquerque was accompanied by three Dominican priests and the conversion started in Goa the Hindus and Muslims of Goa were converted to Roman Catholicism before that there were no Christianity in Goa there were Hindus Muslims and Jews a community of Jews now the first thing that Afonso de Albuquerque did is he got his portuguese soldiers soldados forcibly married to the muslim turki women in goa i am saying the muslim turki women in goa and not of goa they did not belong to goa they were the wives and daughters of the turki officers of the adil shah who were killed in battle between albuquerque and adil shah and they were forcibly converted from islam to roman catholicism so this was the first conversion effected by afonso de albuquerque by the portuguese in goa of the muslim turki women and they were fair skin afonso de albuquerque writes a letter to the king of portugal dom manuel 1 that i have won goa a great task indeed thousands of muslims who fled i have roasted them alive there is blood bath in ela and i have got my soldados married to the fair skin turki muslim women in goa fair skin because he was a he had a color bar color prejudice very much racist and he wanted that the progeny should be fair skin looking like the portuguese and that is why he chose the fair skin because the portuguese was fair skin in goa the portuguese are referred in kokni as pakles because they used to wear a on the head they used to wear a feather pak which is the kokni word for feather that's why they were known as pakle so from there onwards you have afonso de albuquerque the first portuguese governor of goa the first portuguese governor of estado da india was dom francisco da almeida but the first portuguese governor of goa was afonso de albuquerque he lived just for 5 years in goa he died on died in december 15 1515 so 1510 is a turning point a watershed year in the history of goa now not the whole of goa was conquered by the portuguese goa came to be conquered in parts in phases by the portuguese first the goa island was conquered tiswari followed by bardes and salset they came to be known as velash conquistas meaning old conquest in first in 1510 then in 1543 from the adil shah of bijapur three territories were conquered eventually the portuguese conquered ponda sange kepe kankon in south of goa from the sondekar raja who was from karnataka ruling over goa then from bosles of savantwadi the portuguese conquered bicholi satari and the last taluka they they captured in north of goa northernmost taluka pedne first in 1781 they captured bicholi and satari from the bosles of savantwadi and in 1788 they captured the last territory of goa from the bosles of savantwadi with the fort of terakol in 1788 and in 1791 the present day boundaries of goa that you see today the map of goa was drawn because before that in pre portuguese goa the boundaries of goa were very fluid and depending upon the dynasty that ruled over goa the boundaries kept on changing so today's boundaries are basically the portuguese goa the first christian structure that they built in goa was the saint catherine chapel because it was on her feast day they were successful in capturing goa reconquering goa from the adil shah of bijapur and then various missionary orders arrived in goa the first to arrive were the three dominican priest and followed by the franciscans now do not mistake franciscans for 
Saint Francis Xavier. Saint Francis Xavier belonged to the Jesuit order, and Saint Francis of Assisi founded the Franciscan order. They were given one pocket of Goa, one territory of Goa, Bardes for conversion. Goa was parcelled among the various missionary orders for conversion, for converting the Hindus and Muslims to Christianity. Their surnames were changed. Temples were demolished. Churches were built. Chapels were built in their places. The lifestyle of the Goans who were converted underwent a change. Pau was introduced by the Franciscans in 1517 for the first time. Pork was introduced in the life of the converts. The Portuguese introduced papaya, tomatoes, and various other vegetables. This is the welcome ark for the Portuguese governors to take the keys of Goa. The temples were demolished. Here is one such example. The Franciscans built this church of Saint Francis of Assisi in Old Goa. Not of Francis Xavier. Saint Francis Xavier, whose relics you find in Basilica, is at another missionary. He cannot be mistaken for Saint Francis of Assisi. This was built in 1521. Then came the Dominicans, Dominican order, the proper missionary order, and they built the world-renowned monument in Old Goa, which most of the tourists see. Say Cathedral. This is shown to the tourists. Say Cathedral. The date that I found on the facade of this is 15. 62 Then you have the famous basilica of Bon Jesus built by the Jesuits and it is here that the body of Saint Francis Xavier is housed Here is the silver casket in which the body of Saint Francis Xavier is housed Then came the Augustinians These are the various items the Portuguese brought potato to the rest of the country but not to Goa they brought the bread food they brought the papaya they introduced i mean uh, the bebinka was made it was a uh, fusion of indo portuguese the i would say the heritage sweet of goa the bebinka made by sister bebiana portuguese nun pao was introduced tomatoes cashew was introduced by portuguese and today we take cashew nut souvenirs whenever goans uh, the people from outside come to goa they take cashew nuts they take bebinka they introduced pineapples also the inquisition was the darkest chapter in goa's history where people were forcibly converted those who refused to get converted were burnt alive at the stake uh, it was a religious court people were forced to get converted Temp uh, temples were demolished and the people moved their temples deities to the adil shahi territory of ponda and to save themselves from the wrath of inquisition so my ancestors were not converted because they moved to the adil shahi territory which was eventually taken by the portuguese the various temples which were demolished by the portuguese and rebuilt in the adil shahi territory of marsel the mangeshi temple which was originally in the portuguese territory of kortalim was shifted to mangeshi this was not built by lata mangeshkar as the tourist guides would tell you this was built by chatrapati shahu the grandson of chatrapati sambhaji on the request of ramchand malhar sukthankar yes lata mangeshkar's father dinanath mangeshkar used to serve in this temple and lata mangeshkar hailed from this place called mangeshi and she had a house there but she was not born in goa this is the shantadurga temple in kaulen today originally in keshi it was demolished by the portuguese and it was shifted to kaulen here similar stories of all these temples malsa temple of verna was shifted to mardol to save itself from the wrath of inquisition in the 1560s the shantadurga temple of kaule and mangeshi were built by on the orders of chatrapati shahu the grandson of chatrapati uh, shivaji these are the various temples chatrapati shivaji renovated this temple of sapta koteshwar in 1668 since the portuguese were demolishing the idols paper ganpati people resorted to diwali the various forts of goa is an island fort called korzue you must visit built by the portuguese in 1706 this was a fort built by adil shah rebuilt by portuguese and chatrapati sambhaji had conquered it in 1683 The Reshmagosh Fort, 
which was originally built by Adil Shah, entirely rebuilt by Portuguese. Aguada Fort, you can see from the Miramar Beach, where my college is located and my house is located. And this was the fort which was built by the Portuguese between 1604 to 1612 to because of the Dutch. The Dutch would have invaded Goa. Portuguese introduced uniform civil code in Goa in 1867, where the girls have an equal share in their father's property and the marriages take place under the community of assets. The Portuguese and British introduced railways along with the British. These are the palaces of Goa, Makinez's palace. This is the Sondekar Raja, who I had interviewed. His descendants live in Goa and Portuguese had taken the territories from him, the southern territories from him. Underground palace, Satvashila Devi Bosle, the Bosle queen of Savantwadi, whose ancestors ruled over the northern Goa. Diao Palace. This was the bridge built by the Portuguese in 1632, still standing, but the bridges built by our government have been falling and have fallen. But the build, Portuguese built is part of bridge, it is still standing. Various churches. Then we had the freedom struggle in Goa. I just want to uh, say something about these statues. This is the statue of Mr. Robert Knox and his wife, not of Donna and Paulu. There is no Paulu fisherman who is supposed to be in love with Donna, the Portuguese girl, which was perpetuated by Ek Duje Ke Liye. Donna Paula was a Portuguese woman, no doubt. Uh, there was no Paulu. Her name was Donna Paula. Addressed to any senior woman is Donna. This is a statue of Robert Knox and his wife, Donna Paula. This is her grave, Donna Paula's grave. These are the, then we have the freedom struggle led by Dr. T.B. Kunna. We have Satyagraha movement and we have the um, violent movement. And Goa was liberated from the Portuguese rule on 19 December 1961. On 30th May 1987, Goa became a 25th state of the Indian Union. Before that, there was a union, she was a union territory. In 1967, we have the opinion poll where the first government of Goa wanted to merge Goa with Maharashtra. Goans fought against it. And Goa remained a separate identity, separate union territory. On 16 January 1967 and on 30th May 1987, Goa became a state. The first chief minister of Goa after liberation of Goa in 1961, 14 years after India's independence was uh, Dayanand Manodkar. Later on, his daughter Shashikala Kakurkar became the chief minister. And then came the Congress rule of Pratap Singh Rani. The first government was of Maharashtrawadi Govantak Paks. I will stop here because it's a small state, but very lengthy and checkered history. Uh, basically, let's look at the questions. There are lots of questions. People have been interested to know a little more about the Inquisition and the role specifically of St. Francis Xavier. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. Now, the Inquisition was the religious court of the Portuguese. Inquisition meant inquiry. Inquisition meant inquiry. It was set up in Old Goa and it was set up on 5th October 1560. Now it was set up on the invitation of St. Francis Xavier, the Jesuit missionary. St. Francis Xavier was a Jesuit missionary who arrived in Goa on 6th May 1542 and he was a Jesuit missionary and his purpose was evangelization to spread the message of Christ in Goa and to convert the Hindus and Muslims to Christianity and to felicitate conversions. Conversions had already begun in Goa, as I've told you, in, from 1510. From 1541, they had got a spurt. And uh, then uh, St. Francis Xavier found that those Hindus and Muslims who, after their conversion to Christianity, were still following behind closed doors their previous religion. They were following, they were continuing being Hindus and they were continuing being Muslims and they were continuing being Jews. So St. Francis Xavier noticed this, plus the Portuguese society in Goa had become morally decadent. And he found that the people living in Goa, those who were converted, those Portuguese who were living in Goa were not following the message of Christ. They were not living according to the diktats of the Bible and Jesus Christ. 
so to facilitate conversion to drive fear in the people so that it facilitate conversion more hindus get converted to christianity the inquisition was introduced at the behest of saint francis xavier but here i would like to uh, make a submission that by the time saint francis uh, by the time the inquisition arrived in goa it was in 1560 that the inquisition arrived in goa but by that time saint francis xavier had already passed away he had passed away on the intervening night of third second and third december third december uh, after 12 that is why the feast of saint francis xavier is celebrated on third december in the year 1552 in the um, sanshian island of the coast of china and then his body was shipped to goa in 1554 and it was housed in say cathedral first and later on basilica so the inquisition was the darkest chapter the inquisition people feared and the people were burnt alive those who refused to get converted they were burnt alive at stake they um, so the, to fear from the wrath of conversion people went outside goa to places like karwar kumtha malwan and so many other places and they were saved from the conversion and saved from the wrath of inquisition otherwise they would have been burnt alive my ancestors themselves moved away to another territory which was then under adil shah so uh, people were burnt alive they were given two types of torture one is water torture called oporto and one is fire torture and there is a place where the people were burnt alive is still there and so those who refused to get converted they were tortured in various measures by the inquisitors and the inquisition brought about the demolition of temples and mosques a large number of temples in tiswadi barden and salset were demolished by the portuguese and the people shifted it to the adil shahi territory where they found shelter in the adil shahi territory because the adil shah had appointed sir de sais to look after the uh, those territories of ponda sange kepe kanakon the southern territories or the eastern territories of goa so uh, the inquisition ran from 1560 to 1812 and it is a dark chapter of goa's history where people were horrified terrified fear was driven in them they had to move with their deities outside the portuguese territory they were burnt alive temples were demolished in in uh, 1560 1566 around 250 temples were demolished in southern goa so people lived in fear it was a horrible chapter moving on there's a question about the petroglyphs the question is from commander mohan narayan he wants to know if the pansaimal petroglyphs are different from those at us gali mai it's a very good question uh, who has asked this question commander mohan narayan uh, yes command commander sir i would uh, i was quite happy with your question you have a discerning eye i think i i feel you must have visited goa on the bed of the pansai now pansai mall it is not usgari mall see uh, when you visit pansai mall on the left right bed it is a hamlet of the dandole village in south goa and across there is it is on the river bank kushavati river bank across the kushavati river bank is usgari mall okay across the river where there are no petroglyphs but for a long time people thought that both these sites are called usgari mall usgari mall but usgari mall is located in kepen taluka and where the actual petroglyphs are that is called pansai mall or pansai mall pansai mall so when you visit goa do ask for pansai mall in the village of dhandore in south goa you can always contact me my number is there with farooq he will share it the question was about the temples of goa around ponda especially the ones which are personal the the ones dedicated to their family deities what is the reason for so many around ponda again very interesting question who has asked this question harsha uh, harsha very interesting question uh, there are a large number of temples in ponda taluka ponda is a town and a taluka the headquarter town is known as ponda and the entire taluka is known as uh, ponda Uh, so the portuguese had conquered the the territories across the river zuari and across the river mandavi okay that is tiswadi bardes and salset and they were known as the velaj conquistors old conquest 
Now across these rivers, there was the Adil Shahi territory in the 16th century when these temples were demolished. So the people of these territories shifted across the neighboring Ponda Taluka, where they were sheltered by the Adil Shahi territory, and that is why where where Ponda Taluka is located, it was across the river. So it was easy for them in the dead of the night to shift these temples across, which was Ponda, which was then under Adil Shah, not under the Portuguese rule. Ponda Taluka eventually came under Portuguese rule as late as 1763. So that is why you have. a series of temples of mangeshi shantadurga malsa all located in ponda tal kamakshi so many harsha also wanted you to comment on the portuguese influence in the temples around that area yeah the portuguese influence see these temples in ponda taluka if you see the architecture of the temples um in the pre portuguese times it was different but during the portuguese times you have the influence you have the stained glass windows which is a gothic feature you have uh, the uh, spikes or the spears which is again a gothic feature in the temple ball finials you have the dome which is of course islamic and uh, some of the uh, one or two churches also have this dome that is an islamic influence uh, but we also have domes Uh, uh, in pre-Portuguese times, so we cannot entirely say it is Islamic. There are different types of domes. So we have the. Uh, so these are the uh, influences. Uh, so if, if you enter a temple in Ponda, it will be different from the temple in Pedne and other talukas because there is a Portuguese influence on that. The you will find that the architectural features. Okay, some of the Portuguese architectural features, such as the Aves board. okay you will find in the temples okay so uh, uh, so those uh, features are are found chandeliers are found in the uh, temples so those features are found red x oxide flooring okay we got the question from floor, from dr floor who were at the receiving end for of all the punishments were they the recent converts uh dr floor i think i have i know her she is a historian and she is from the javier's college bombay yes yeah so doctor what i would like to state is uh um, the those who have who had converted to christianity you know there were various incentives provided to conversion conversion of course were forced but there are other theories also you have uh, where people you know to uh, in, to move upward in the social mobility to escape from the caste shackles or domination of brahmins many people were converted they voluntarily converted this is another theory which is floated so we have to look at conversions from various angles but the more uh, the pronounce and the authentic uh, authentic theory is that people were forced to convert especially during the inquisition period and uh, from 1541 the conversions had started uh, in uh, old goa and tiswari and bardes and uh, so people were also provided incentives such as jobs they were given various uh, freedom from shackles so the missionaries used to come that they will be free from the caste shackle but uh, let me tell you that goa is the only place in india where the catholics have retained their caste they renounce their religion they renounce all the previous hindu rituals everything food habits also but they retain the uh, their uh, caste so today we have the roman catholic brahmins so even in the matrimonial columns you will find that a roman catholic brahmin seeking a matrimonial alliance from roman catholic brahmin girl a roman catholic brahmin boy from a roman catholic brahmin boy so the caste system has remained intact so um, uh, the conversions happened from uh, 1510 uh, onwards and it continued to happen those people who today are hindus that is uh, 65% of today's population are hindus are those who migrated outside the portuguese territories or those who are from those territories which were under the adil shah like ponda sange kepe kankon you will not find that there are um, more catholics over there 
it is predominantly hindu dominated north of goa such as padne bicholi satri predominantly hindus they remain hindus because the conversion zeal by the time they captured these territories that is ponda sange kepe kanakon um, satri bicholi and uh, padne the conversion zeal had died down so they remain hindus and but the conversion zeal was very much pronounced in uh, tiswadi bardes and salse where the people were converted to christianity and today you'll find catholics more in tiswadi bardes and salse where the portuguese had conquered these in the 16th century staying with roman catholicism uh, commander wanted to know about the church of saint blaise he believes that it was built uh, by somebody from croatia in goa could you tell him a little more about that yes uh there is uh, there is this um, uh, saint blaise church uh in uh, in a village called uh, gaundali actually that village is part of old goa which is next to old goa is a village called gaundali and there the see the missionaries that arrived in goa were the franciscans dominicans jesuits augustinians carmelites uh, the santa monica nuns who are known for their culinary you know they made the bibimka and all that and uh, the last order that arrived in goa to spread christianity were the theer times then there was a mission in the uh, uh, there was a mission from croatia which had arrived and they had built this particular church which is the saint blaise church in gaudari and till today the croatian people visit that that particular church it is the only church which was built by the croatians are dedicated to saint blaise so this would have been in which year approximately prajal uh this particular the croatian mission it is little later after the theodine order did work for the adil shah for the marathas and all that so the saundekar was like a vassal of many of these dynasties so the saundekar raja had territory in today's goa which is then the ponda sange kepe kankon these ter southern territories of goa were under the saundekar the southern territories of goa were under the saundekar okay and uh, so and on other side of the river was of course the portuguese goa so the adil shah had granted these territories to the saundekars then it exchanged many hands in between came the marathas then the uh, saundekar became vassals of the marathas in 1763 haider ali the father of tipu sultan the king of mysore attacked saunda when haider ali the father of tipu sultan attacked saunda in 1763 january the saundeka raja seeked asylum with the portuguese in goa so he requested the portuguese to give him asylum in goa and to protect him and his territories in goa and the cabo de rama fort and the betul fort from the invasion of haider ali and the portuguese gave him asylum and he got for him built an underground palace which is still existing okay and the family was sheltered in that underground palace in 1763 eventually in the early 18th century the saundeka raja built a palace outside the nageshi temple in the ponda taluka the nageshi temple is located in the bandoda village and uh, there is an inscription of the vijayanagar period which i shared with you 1413 and the saundeka raja and vijayanagar sansthan had matrimonial relations so the saundekar was eventually given those territories and the nageshi temple received the patronage of the saundekar so the portuguese okay. gave him asylum and the saundekar raja became a vassal of the portuguese i had interviewed him and he had narrated okay this that's a very detailed answer for preeti i hope she's got the answer that she was looking on looking for staying with temples can you throw some light on the ancient temple of shiva in benolim in benolim benolim yeah 
Goa has a large number of uh, Shaivite uh, Shiva temples. Uh, not so much as Vishnu temples, there are, but large number of predominantly the Shiva temples. The most famous of these is the temple of um, uh, Shiva Mahadev in Tamri Sulla, which all of you must uh, visit once you are. It was built by the Kadambas in the 12th century. Then you have the at another Mahadev temple, which are older than Tamri Sulla temple, which was built in. Uh, I've shown you the slide, the transplanted temple. So in Banawali village, which is a south village, a large village, famous for its coconuts and the beach, there was the Shiva temple. That particular Shiva temple, which Banawalikas of course worship, was eventually demolished by the Portuguese and the church was built. In Banawali itself, there were a number of temples which were uh, demolished by the Portuguese, including Katayani, Baneshwari, and the Portuguese built the uh, uh, churches such as John the Baptist and many other chapels and churches in Banaoli. Similarly, in other places, the okay. temples were demolished. Okay. Um, I think we're reaching the last few questions. Uh, uh, could you tell us about the first medical college in Asia, which was established by the Jesuits soon after the Portuguese got hold of Goa? Yeah, here I want to make a submission that uh, uh, the Goa Medical College, which was uh, then known as Ishkola Medica Serujica de Nova Goa, uh, that was actually the second college in the whole of Asia. Uh, because in 1830, this was established in, on 5th November 1842, because on, in 1835, there was a medical college in Calcutta. Recently, one historian in Goa has brought out this. In Calcutta, there was a college medical school, which was the first in the whole of Asia, which was put up by the British and the Portuguese introduced the medical school, Ishkola Medica, on 5th November 1842. So I would say that okay. there was a second medical school. Okay. Uh, tourist guides normally tell us that Shantadurga is the patron, patron deity of Goa. Is that correct in your view? No, the patron deity of Goa, the presiding deity of Goa is the Roen, that is the earth bound, who has, give, who has been given a face called Sateri. Sateri is the patron de presiding deity of Goa. Uh, Shantadurga came much later. She is supposed to have been brought by the Gaur Saraswat Brahmins from uh, Bengal, Tirhut in Bengal, Tirhotrapur. And she is my brother, I belong to that. So Nina, don't believe what the tourist guides tell you. Here's your authoritative... Uh... Answer. You can take uh, me as a guide when you come to Goa. <laughs> we'll come to that. There are questions in that area also. Okay. Uh, one last question about architecture, religion, etc. Before we move on to the lighter ones, how do you explain the Portuguese influence on Hindu temples when actually the the Hindus are trying to escape persecution, conversion, etc. No, because by the time this particular, to see, when in the 16th century, people migrated across the rivers just with their deities. Okay. In 66, 15, uh, 66, on, speci specifically 1566, when they migrated, they just took their deities. And they built a small hut, like a, with a palm fraud and some laterite stone, they built a small hut. Eventually, Taking these three examples of the three famous touristic temples where the tourists are usually shown when they are give, uh, taken on a South Goa tour on the tourism itinerary, I will take the example of Mangeshi temple. This particular, the temple that you see today was built during the time of Chhatrapati Shahu, the grandson of Chhatrapati okay. uh, Shivaji. Okay. Shahu was the son of Chhatrapati Sambhaji. And in his Darbar in Satara, there were Goans. Now, one Goan, I would like to mention the case of Mangeshi temple was Ramchandra Malar Suktankar. He requested Chhatrapati Shahu to, uh, because he was a devotee of Mange, to build that temple. So, in today's parlance, Shahu, Chhatrapati Shahu sponsored the construction of these temples. Of that temple. By the time the temples were built, the Portuguese, the zeal of conversion and all those things had died down and people were more accepting of the architectural styles across the Portuguese Goa, in Portuguese Goa. 
they were ready to across it in other uh, accepted in other areas but if you look at the uh, temples which were uh, in uh, the, the then non portuguese territories which later on were conquered by the portuguese but they are still in intact like tamri sula temple is intact with its original architectural style of the kadambas because that zeal of conversion had died down inquisition had died down well yeah and missionaries were banned in 1835 by the way by mark kumbal who was the sir the question of parimala uh, i just want to clarify the previous question was not from ninad it was from commander ninad uh, moving on to the what i would like to call the lighter type questions uh parvez wants to know uh, do the upper castes in goa also eat fish in fact he is asking about vegetarianism in goa in fact upper castes of goa only eat fish they cannot do without fish saraswat community there are two types of brahmins in goa saraswat communities are fish eating brahmins and then uh, those who perform uh, pujas in the temples there are bhajis bhats okay the kokanas so deshas they do not consume fish but uh, saraswat of course can when upper caste cannot do without in fact goans cannot do without fish except those who perform pujas in the temple or uh, everybody eats fish in goa every day there is fish curry every day there is fried fish so that answers parvez's question uh is there a go to person or organization in goa who can take everyone around these off beat places the the comment was that this person who's asking the question has been to goa many times but has not heard any of these places that you've spoken about and they would like to visit so if you want who to do a off beat kind of holiday yes. or a tour who, who do they contact who has asked this question i'm sorry i don't have the name i i have aren't 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 first thing is you have to contact me and uh, take down my number from farooq as my number when you land in goa i will show you the off beat goa we have a group called goa heritage action group we organize heritage trips uh, since i am the associate professor of history in uh, dempe college i organize heritage trails for my students uh, okay now because of this pandemic everything has come to a stand still i organize kushavati heritage trail all these off beat places i organize heritage trails for my students but uh, all of you are most welcome the moment you come to goa do give me a bus i will Uh, if i cannot make it accompany you i will ask my students to accompany you but i'll try to be uh, on the field with you great and so the next this sort of melds into the next question abhishek wants to know what is your view about when goa is going to be open for traveling in it then goa i know difficult question for an academician like you to answer but uh, No, I, I what did is not your get, opinion? What is your gut feeling? I did not get the question. What is it about? What is when it? is Goa going to open up for travel? When is Goa going to open up for travel? In the light of the Corona pandemic, saying uh, light of the pandemic. Correct. Yeah, it's already the <laughs> Goa government has opened the boundaries, borders. People have started coming in. Okay. People have started coming in. and now uh, september october november december is the tourist season in goa okay yes of course we, uh, in fact the goan economy is surviving on tourism i do not know how the government is going to tide over this crisis if the tourists do not come especially we have a large number of foreigners coming into goa yes of course we had the hippie movement in goa i do not know whether you have heard dammar oh, yes the big thing in the 70s and 80s Yeah, hippie. You must have heard of Eight Finger Eddie, the American hippie who founded the hippie movement. Yes. And uh, Oko Kero, and Charles Subraj. Charles Subraj was caught there on 6th April 1986 in Oko yes. Kero, which is. So I think this brings us to the end of the questions, Prajal. Thank you very much. It was very fascinating to okay. hear so many layers in the culture of uh, 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 Goa and how people so peacefully existed. next to each other sometimes with a lot with some difficulties but by and large all these various levels in the architecture and the culture and the habits it was really fascinating as you would have seen from some of the comments which came in thank you everyone for attending this talk questions were very interesting also very interesting questions yes very good because they covered religion they covered yes. architecture they covered yeah. culture 
just about everything. And of course, your answers to the questions were very detailed. Thank you.